Uh, soy Kate. Uh, yo vivo en Medellín, bonito Medellín. Uh, <laughs> uh, me encanta, encanta Colombia, es mi hogar. Y uh, quiero mucho hablar en español hoy, uh, pero no puedo. <laughs> Necesito más palabras uh, para este charla y uh, pero, pero la vida, por la vida. Pero no dónde contactar en inglés, en español o en Francia. Uh, gracias por, pero, uh, por, me, por invitarme. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Entonces, en inglés. Disculpe. Uh, most technical interviewers are bad. A lot of the discussion around technical interviews skirts around this like fundamental issue. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons why. The format, the perpetuation of something most akin to a hazing ritual, um, the general level of social skills in this industry. Uh, and I don't find these reasons very compelling. In general, we're bad interviewers, and we should do better. My name is Kate, and I was a bad technical interviewer. What can I say? I was young, and I really did not know what a good technical interview looked like. But I was very motivated to do better because my interviewing situation was really weird. Um, I used to interview mostly women. Like, two-thirds of my interviews were with women. Has anybody else experienced this? One of the women in the audience. Mi amiga Camille. Um, so it's this thing when you work in an organization that believes the problem is the pipeline. Um, and so they aggressively recruit women. And they want those women to think that other women actually work there. You know, you really can't let on that there are more men named Dave or Juan. Um, and so, you know, voila, women who interview, interview a lot of women. So I interviewed all these women, um, and sometimes I would come in and they would be really close to tears. Uh, and sometimes I would read feedback from other interviewers that seemed really biased. And I believed that this system was fundamentally broken, but I had no power to change it. I just participated in it. So I set out to make the experience, the part of the experience that I did have control over better. I learned how to seem warmer, how to make someone feel more comfortable. I learned how to ask a question and pay attention to when to hint and when to wait. I learned to listen whilst taking detailed notes and writing down every line of code. And I learned to go over my feedback with a fine tooth comb to minimize bias. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. This is a talk about individual processes not about systems. And the idea is that wherever you are in an organization, you can take these things that we're going to talk about and you can use them to make the part of the experience that you do control better. At the end, we're going to get a little bit meta and we're going to take on the question of how do you coach other people to be better interviewers? So interviewing someone is actually quite unnatural, right? It often gets compared to dating, which I deeply hate. Don't get me started. <laughs> but if we follow a process that, oh, sorry, there's a massive power imbalance, right? And you get basically no feedback on how you're doing. And there's something kind of sociopathic, actually, about being able to objectively judge someone whilst you convince them that you're a nice, warm person who's enjoying your time together. <laughs> and for us, as individuals trying to be better interviewers, this is about process and not about outcomes. If we follow a process that's respectful to the people that we interview, um, that's mindful of our own biases, then we can feel better about those outcomes even if they don't change. And hopefully it's a process that people who participate in feel less bad about. I'm not gonna make grandiose claims of feeling good, you know, because if you interview somewhere and you want the job and you don't get it, it sucks. Um, but it sucks so much more if it seems like nobody you spoke to ever really wanted to speak to you. So essentially, I'm going to tell you not to be a jerk for a bit. 
Well, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a process that you can use to seem like less of a jerk. <laughs> because it's really not about changing who you are, but what you do. Uh, so first, we're going to talk a bit about being empathetic. Uh, empathy is something that we feel, but we can set ourselves up for empathy. Or perhaps more accurately, the performance of empathy. And this comes from knowing ourselves. And you know, the way that I think about this is that it's much easier for me to be nice to other people if my own needs have been met. And empathy in this context is kind of useless if we don't apply it. Um, but how do we apply empathy? Well, we understand bias. We can use bias to make people feel better about the process, but we don't want bias to impact our own conclusions. So we're going to talk to someone for an hour. What are our own needs in that context? Maybe that we actually have an hour to talk to them. We can start there. If someone is interviewing for a job, it's probably one of the most important things that they're going to do that day. And we can reflect that importance in our own schedule um, and allow time before and after. One of my friends likes to go to a secret garden for 15 minutes before every interview. And what a beautiful way to get in the right headspace. But what else might we need? Well, we could think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Sleep, food, bathroom breaks, Wi-Fi. <laughs> We've all heard about being hangry, right? But did you know that lack of sleep affects your morality? I flew all night to be here, so no one should cross me today. <laughs> so 26 healthy adults, um, all active duty military personnel, uh, they were presented with a variety of hypothetical di dilemmas. First, when they were well rested, and later, after they had been kept awake for 53 hours. And so questions ranged from things like, is it okay to substitute ingredients in a chocolate brownie recipe, uh, to complex moral quandaries like whether to let one person die in order to save the lives of several others. And the headline is, affects morality. But participants didn't actually become less moral when they were sleep deprived. But they did require two seconds longer on average to answer the questions with a moral component. But it didn't take longer to answer the questions without one after they were kept awake. Oh, OK. Um, so did you know the biggest predictor of whether a prisoner will be released on parole? It's time of day. Or, more accurately, how recently the judge last ate. Even more, it's not actually time, it's how many cases they've heard since they last had a snack. Um, and so other interesting factoids, the average unfavorable decision took less time to arrive at, 5.2 minutes, compared to the average favorable one, 7.4 minutes. And it also took more time to explain averaging 90 words compared to just 47 for unfavorable decisions. And I feel like techies, we often like to pretend that we're really just one step away from being computers ourselves. <laughs> uh, but we have to get real. Like We're like other humans, and we have the same limitations in hardware and software. Um, and it's really worth being aware of what they are. So now let's talk about being in the right headspace. Um, and I think of this as believing that the person that I'm interviewing is a capable person who is able to do this job, and that I myself am capable of evaluating them in a meaningful way. And so proactively finding things, finding and dealing with things that challenge this, right? I stopped reading resumes for two reasons. The first is that as someone who was doing an algorithms and data structures interview, and a resume was just a bias factor that offered me really no information that would influence my interview. And the second is that a resume is a sales document for a human. Um, and so I would read the resume, and I would feel like I wasn't qualified to interview them. And this did not put me in the best frame of mind for interviewing them. I spent most of 2015 fun employed and roaming the world. And one thing I did for a couple of startups was I started helping them with their interview process. Uh, including doing technical phone screens for them. One of my clients had a really high no-show rate, um, and I could feel it affecting me as an interviewer, because it started to really stress me out. Um, and I was getting really frustrated with how many people weren't showing up and like not expecting people to show up, you know? 
Um, so I tried some things, and then when they didn't improve, I ended up telling them that I was going to charge them for no-shows of a certain percentage. And like, one, this was very motivating to them to like sort things out and have a lower no-show rate. Um, but you know, the main thing and the main reason why I did it was that it helped me be in a better headspace for interviewing the people who did show up. <laughs> I love this vacoon. We're going to talk about her a lot. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about being empathetic, right? And so really I'm going to talk about a functional kind of empathy, like fake it until you make it empathy. And step one is about being in a state of warmth. And this is where this raccoon can help us. So there's a book called The Charisma Myth, which I really recommend reading. But we're going to do something quickly together to illustrate this. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you and introduce yourself. Uh, but first, we're going to make you seem nicer. So you may make a new friend today. You're welcome. <laughs> so if you can, can you please stand up? Because we have more energy when we stand up. So this is my favorite raccoon. <laughs> um, because she's like riding an alligator or a crocodile. I don't know, some creature with a lot of teeth. Um, and, you know, I just want to give her a high five, right? Like, my goal in life is really to be as awesome as this raccoon. <laughs> um, and so now I want you to shut your eyes and take a deep breath. And breathe out. And breathe in. And breathe out. Okay, great. So now I want you to think about someone or something that you love. Keep your eyes closed. I see you. Um, <laughs> your child, your partner, your pet, your best friend, a cuddly toy. Um, for those of you who have nothing in your life, this is why I provided you this raccoon. <laughs> so now I want you to really focus on this feeling of love. I love this raccoon so much. She's everything I want to be. I have so much admiration for her. Um, and like really think about the best qualities of whatever or whoever it is that you're thinking about. You know, she has a beautiful tail. She's clearly a badass. Um, <laughs> all right. So I want you to let this feeling of love flow through you and just really feel it. Okay. And then in a second, you're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to extend this feeling of warmth towards them. Okay. Ready? Just focus a little more on the awesome thing you're thinking about. Ready? Go. Okay. Did you did you feel the difference from how you normally introduce yourself? Yeah? Did anyone make a new friend? No. Well, there's still time. <laughs> um, so other fake it until you, oh, you can sit down now. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so other fake it until you make it strategies they include what I think of as basic manners, right? So you can say, how are you today? And then you can care about the answer. Um, you can say, is now still a good time to talk? And mean it. And then here's one. Oh, is that not clear? Let me explain it to you again. And then be happy to explain it again. So let's talk about this last one for a minute, right? Because it's really important. In any relationship with a power dynamic, the person with the most power has the most impact on the quality of that relationship. Which means that in an interviewing context, the burden of building a good rapport falls on you, the interviewer. The candidate has not come in determined to hate and misunderstand you. Assume that they're doing their best and be sympathetic to the fact that interviewing is really, really stressful. Oh, bye-bye, raccoon. <laughs> so <laughs> the final step is applying our empathy, right? And this is where understanding bias comes in. There's a lot of discussion about bias lately, but bias is essentially the human condition. And sometimes it works for us, and sometimes it works against us. If you want to understand how bias can be manipulated to make people feel better about things, look at the way that Disney approaches queuing. 
And if you want to understand how bias works against us, look at race relations and policing in the US. So we want to use bias to make people feel better, right? But we want to mitigate bias in our conclusions. So one way that we can use bias is that endings are disproportionately important to how people feel about something overall. So let's, let's go back to that raccoon. I need her. Um, so we think about her again and we say, thank you so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate you making time. Another way, oh, so now we're moving bias. So, oh, sorry. Another way to use bias is that people feel better about situations where they have some kind of choice um, and where they have control. Right? And so one way we can give people control is we can give them choice. Not too much choice, because too much choice is really overwhelming, but in certain places we can give them a choice and they'll feel like they're more in control of the situation. So programming language is a good one, or approaches to solving the problem. If you look for places where you can highlight that the person you're interviewing has a choice, then they will feel more in control. So now, removing bias. So for me, this is a three-pronged approach. Firstly, Factoring in time to write up my feedback immediately after the interview. Second, keeping detailed notes with timing um, of everything. So I'm not going on feelings about how long things took. I can look and I can know. And third is taking an extra pass through my feedback and removing things like conclusions I can't support. Um, and we're going to talk more about conclusions in a moment. Um, and gendered or racially biased feedback. You know, so for example, lacking confidence, the suggestion that someone's more junior than they are. You know, if you educate yourself on the kind of words that we're much happier to use about women and minorities, then, you know, you can make an effort to remove them from your feedback. And, you know, that will help mitigate bias. And this is in and of itself a huge topic. So now let's talk about the question. Right? We've talked about how we can personally give a better experience, but let's move on to what kind of question we're asking and what we can expect to learn from it. And so this relates to the second big problem of technical interviews, is that we think that they teach us more than they do. Um, and we should start with this distinction between good questions and bad questions. Bad questions tell you essentially nothing. If you ask someone to code a solved computer science problem on a whiteboard, then all you learn is if they have memorized the solution to that particular problem and if they can reproduce it in a state of stress. <laughs> a good technical question is one with multiple answers and trade-offs. You know, it's a problem large enough that you know, it can't be solved by a single call to a library function. Um, and it requires some thought and discussion. And once you're asking a good question, you can start to get a sense of how does someone approach a problem? Do they dive in and start writing code, or do they really take some time to understand it first? How do they break it down? Can they discuss trade-offs? Can they consider how different inputs would change things? Do they understand the benefits of different data structures? Like This is not the same as asking someone to implement data structures, but data structures are very foundational, and different data structures are appropriate for different scenarios. And it's important to understand when to use one rather than another. But I think the most important question that I aim to answer in each interview is, do they listen? I don't think you learn that much from someone who knows the answer and writes it down. You know, and that's pretty much the extent of your communication. Maybe you've learned that they're pretty smart. Maybe you've learned that they write code pretty fast when they know what it is they're doing. But you don't know how they're going to respond to a problem where they don't immediately know the answer. And unless it's a job that they're going to find really boring, that's probably going to happen. And when they can't immediately solve a problem, you can start to see, you know, do they look at their own work objectively and see problems with it? And do they listen to feedback? The other question I aim to get a sense of is, how do they respond to new information? And the approach I use for this is, I say, I'm, we're going to play a game that I call Unreasonable Product Manager. <laughs> Uh, and then what happens is I fundamentally change the requirements whilst pretending that nothing has really happened. <laughs> and I want to see how they incorporate this information into what they have. So these are some things that I think you can learn, right? And to be clear, I don't always get a sense of these in every interview. But if I don't, I can mark in my feedback, I didn't really see this from this person. But there are some really glaring omissions that I think are very relevant to the day-to-day -day work of software engineering. I'm sure you can all think of some. 
Yeah? Um, how about, how do they function in the last 20% of shipping a project? Because that can be pretty boring, eh? Or how do they work in a code base of significant scope? Can they work with legacy code, or will they insist on rewriting everything? Can they prioritize? Do they give thoughtful code reviews? Will they be a good mentor to other developers? And will they take direction? And we kind of covered this a bit, but it you know, kind of shows up more in a if they really won't kind of way. And will they adapt to the processes that you have? So code review, test coverage. It's important to recognize the limitations of these interviews um, as, an interv as an individual, not just as an organization. Because part of being a good interviewer, of trying to be a good interviewer, is not to give feedback on aspects that you really don't have any evidence for. And not to delude yourself that you do. So having go th gone through these caveats, what does a good question look like? Well, I think it has three characteristics. One, it gives a sense of problem solving and understanding. Two, it's explorable and extendable. And three, it's deeply understood by the interviewer. So let's go deeper into these. So a question that involves problem solving and understanding is one where there isn't a quick answer. You know, in fact, there should be many possible answers, and you know, the candidate should need to decompose it into smaller problems in order to solve it. And this criteria eliminates knowledge questions and factoids. If a question requires memory of a minor detail that rarely arises in day-to-day -day programming, it's a bad question. And it also eliminates answers that are easily searchable. You know, if there's any question where there might be a specific answer on Stack Overflow, it is a bad question. Assuming people's performance on a question falls on a normal distribution, a few people really struggle to come up with an answer, and a few people will quickly produce a perfect answer. And most people will fall somewhere in the middle. And so a good question really needs to cater to this range of scenarios. And so one approach here is to ask a really, really big question and just say, well, pretty much no one's going to get through it. Um, and I'm really not a big fan of this approach because I think everybody ends up leaving feeling bad about themselves because they didn't complete it. That's really not an experience that I want to give people. But some alternatives. Firstly is building up. So the first question constitutes part of a problem, and then you situate it within a bigger problem and ask what changes things. And then you can repeat that. Um, another alternative is to change constraints. So the initial question is very manageable in size, and the candidate comes up with a solution. And then you can, as an interviewer, can either change the constraints or change the requirements, and then see what happens. And you can keep repeating that. Whichever approach is taken, some things that I really like to see are reasoning about what changes and what doesn't as the situation changes, um, an intentional consideration of what code can be reused and what shouldn't be. So deeply understood by the interviewer. I think it's easy to think that if two people ask the same question, they give close to the same interview. And I don't believe that this is true. Technical interviews are not standardized tests. They're a system involving the interviewer, the candidate, the environment, the programming language, and the question. And even when the interviewer, the question, and the environment are constant, with a question of any complexity, it's going to be very different each time because different candidates will see the di problem differently. And this is possibly influenced by the choice of programming language. More on that later, right? And take a different route through it. And this is why the interviewer's understanding of the question is so important because you have to be able to follow fundamentally different implementations in different languages. So I think of it as the question is an island, and the candidate is landing on it for the first time. And as an interviewer, you need to be the person with a map who can guide them through. And this brings us to one of the most important skills of being a good interviewer, time management. <laughs> so why is this so important? Because it determines how much the candidate is able to show you. Good time management is about minimizing the time spent on nonsense and maximizing the time spent on stuff that you actually want to know about. So people who learn to interview well as like candidates, one of the things they tend to do well is interview time management. But if someone hasn't learned that skill, it's not necessarily a strong signal about whether or not they'll be a good engineer. 
And I'm going to differentiate here between time management in general, which is like a very useful skill, <laughs> and like interview time management, um, which is where you show that you understood things without actually having to spend time on them. So for example, someone who's doing good interviewing time management will say, oh, normally I would validate these inputs for, for whatever. Do you want me to do that? And then any reasonable interviewer will say, don't bother. Where someone who hasn't mastered the skill of time management as an interviewee will, will be like, oh, I should validate this. And then we'll spend a non-zero amount of time adding a bunch of validation code that is just not really interesting or useful, unless the interviewer stops them. So things to think about is like, how much t do you expect a good candidate to get through? And how long should each section within your interview take? Because what are our goals? Our goals are that time is spent in places proportional to what we learn from it, and that the interview keeps moving along. So what does this mean? The candidate gets stuck. Is your job as an interviewer to help them get unstuck. But how long you spend on that should be proportional to how important the thing is. If the mistake is a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem, then it's really worth spending some time there. If they've just made a typo, like I think we should all just move on. So I put together some example escalations for different kinds of mistakes. Um, and this is what I do when I'm giving feedback in a remote pair programming interview. So if someone has an off by one, I'll say, I think you have an off by one. <laughs> and then you know, hopefully they find it. And if not, I will suggest a test case that will demonstrate that problem. If that doesn't work, I will highlight the section of the code where the problem is. And if that doesn't work, I'll fix it myself and move on. If they have a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem, then I'll first ask them what they understand the problem to be. If they've misunderstood, I'll explain it again. Um, ideally, I'll use a different way to explain it than I did the first time. I'll then maybe write it down for them. I'll ask them if their code will work. Now we have this new understanding of the problem. Um, and I will suggest a test case that demonstrates the problem. Then I'll highlight the section of code where the problem is. And then eventually, I will tell them explicitly what is wrong. And if that doesn't work, I will fix it myself and we'll move on. If someone makes a typo, you know what I do? I say, oh, here you have a typo. I fixed it for you. <laughs> so what you notice in the first two cases is that I gradually escalate the bluntness of the feedback. And one thing I find, especially in people who don't have a lot of experience interviewing, is that first I have to be pretty blunt. Um, but if they're good, they pick up on it and get a lot quicker at figuring out and fixing problems themselves. And for me, this is a really, really good sign. So it's important to understand that programming languages used can fundamentally change the problem. Um, I think it's really obvious that solving a problem in Haskell is different from solving it in C, but solving a problem in Python is different from solving it in Java, and both of these are very different from solving it in C. Languages don't just differ in syntax, but also in library methods available and the ease of using them. So C, sorting numbers in JavaScript. And the choice of data structures available in the core libraries. And this means that you can't compare progress. If someone is writing Python and they got through 80% of the question, and someone writing C got through 70%, you can't conclude that the Python programmer was a better programmer, because they were just doing different things. And the solution to this is that you can constrain everyone to the same language. But if someone is writing code in a language that they use every day, and another person is not, then once again, they're doing different things. So my solution for algorithms and data structures is that people code in whatever language they want. Um, and I'm familiar enough with common choices that I understand how they differ, what's harder, how problems are generally approached. And I ask questions about things I'm unfamiliar with. So bonus, I get to learn things. This is a Ruby conference. I'll tell you any Ruby I know. I learn interviewing people in Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> So these are my takeaways. Um, finding a good technical interview question is really hard. You can expect to spend some time on it. Uh, deep understanding of the question is key to interviewing time management. Uh, two people asking the same question is not the same. And two people answering the same question in different languages is not the same. So I'm just going to skip a bit here because my time management has frankly been poor. <laughs> but there's another raccoon picture, so let's just take a moment. 
<laughs> All right. I want to show you something that I found hilarious. It's a snippet from an article about a Google age discrimination lawsuit. And here's a bit. The interviewer was 10 minutes late to the call, barely fluent in English, and used a speakerphone that did not function well. Heath politely asked him repeatedly to use the phone's headset, but that request was declined. Consequently, Heath and the interviewer had difficulty understanding each other. One part of the interview involved writing a short program to find an answer to a problem posed by the interviewer. Heath accomplished the task and offered to share it via Google Docs or email, but instead the interviewer required Heath to read the program coding over the phone. It did not go well. Shocker. Um, and the interviewer seemed not to understand what was being read. And so I found this hilarious because I'm a terrible person, um, but also because it just sounds like a really bad interviewer, right? Like he was rude, he was lacking empathy, and he was really resentful of having to do it. And what do you learn when the candidate can't hear anything you're saying? I really doubt anything meaningful about their ability as an engineer. Maybe how they react to having their time wasted and being set up to fail, um, but I don't really like to think about the kind of environment where that's useful information. <laughs> but it's also a structural failure because one question I have is did this interviewer get any feedback on how they were as an interviewer before there was a lawsuit? And so this guy lawyered up, and you know, good luck to him. And I share this with you to emphasize the power that we have as interviewers. We can give people terrible experiences that we learn very little from, or we can give people the best experience we can and learn as much as possible, but not more than we think we do. It is really hard work, but I hope you have some more idea about how to do it and why it's worthwhile now. Um, and for me, this is not a one-time thing, but a process that I continually work to live up to. And I really hope that the next time you interview, your interviewer is as considerate as you. Thank you.